Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Finally back in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're on sermon number 9 in the book of Ecclesiastes, but we've been out of Ecclesiastes. I just turned it on. For, thank you. Uh, we've been out of Ecclesiastes since... It's, the last message was June 11th, so however many weeks that is. been like a month and a half since we've been in the book of Ecclesiastes. I went on vacation and then... Just other things, we've had missionaries, and I wanted to preach some other messages, so it's been a while. So just kind of to catch everybody up, let me summarize chapter 1 and 2, and I can do it really quickly. Solomon says, I tried everything, everything stinks. <laughs> That's a great summary of chapter 1 and 2. Yeah. Money, women, power, prestige, tried it all, said it all was vanity, all empty. Chapter 3, then, we start seeing a change in Solomon where he starts to realize a few things. It's, he's, still, he's still not in the right frame of mind, but he's getting in a better frame of mind because he realizes if, I, if it's all me that has to worry, if, I have to, if it's my money, if it's my job, if it's my children, if it's me that has control, I have to be worried. If God has control, it'll work out. And then he came to a second conclusion that everything is beautiful in God's time. If you give God enough time, God will make everything beautiful. Now I'm going to warn you, chapter 4, it's kind of like chapter 1 and 2, he starts kind of backsliding a little bit. But it's not going to be as depressing of a message because I think it's an easy fix and it flows with the theme that we seem to have had these uh, last few messages, at least in my mind. Maybe you don't see the theme and that's okay. Anyways, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we're going to start the chapter. If you would please stand in honor of God's word if you're able. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse number 1. So I returned. Things were going good. He comes to the conclusion that man is nothing but animals outside of God, which gives us hope that with God we're something much better. But then he says, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold the tears of such as were oppressed. And they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore I praise the dead, which are already dead, that's kind of how dead people usually are anyway, but <laughs> why is this man to ever live? It's kind of a weird way to say it. More than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they. So he's saying better is this person than the dead or those that are alive. Better are both they which hath not yet seen, or yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, quick message in my mind, Lord. It's simple, uh, with simple truths, but help us to apply it to our lives. Help us to understand it. Help us to grasp it. Uh, Lord, Still, uh, I'm still dwelling on this morning's message, Lord, and just a fresh look at the cross would really solve most of my problems with um, being a secret disciple of you. Uh, but Lord, it's, it's really, it's come down to our thinking, and this one sh hopefully will help with that. Uh, Lord, empty me of self, and the Holy Spirit as I preach. Uh, be with your people, uh, encourage them, challenge them through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I've titled the message tonight, tonight, today, this afternoon, whatever time it is. Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. There's a Latin phrase that goes, cogito ergo sum. And it's translated, I think, therefore I am. Now, that Latin phrase was said in the 1600s, but it, it's actually been true and stated long before that because the Bible has that same principle. What you think in your heart, so are you. What, and this is kind of the important part of this, what you think will lead you to who you are. What you think will lead you to who you are. There are really two key questions of to ask when predicting somebody's future. Can he do something, which is an issue of ability, and will he, which is an issue of attitude. Attitude is the major difference between success and failure. Our attitude determines our altitude. Some of us are struggling with an attitude of worthlessness. Some of us are struggling with an attitude of lovelessness. Some of us are struggling with an attitude of bitterness. Some of us are struggling with an attitude of fear. Some of us are, strag are struggling with an attitude of hopelessness. Why? Because we are doing what my pastor calls stinking thinking. <laughs> Brother McKinley, a long time ago, I don't know where he got it. I don't think it's original to him. But he used to say, you got to stop the stinking thinking. I guess that maybe is an old term, I don't know, but that's where I heard it from. So I had to define stinking thinking for you since I'm going to say something like stinking thinking. 
worthlessness. I stink. No peace with myself. Lovelessness. You stink. No peace with others. Bitterness. Fear. Hopelessness. All those fall under the category of life stinks. I have no peace with God. When we think this way, we are robbed of our peace. We're robbed of our peace with ourselves because we think we think we stink. We're robbed with our peace with others because we think they stink. And we're robbed with our peace with God because we think life stinks. Solomon, our passage, gets a bad case of what my pastor calls stinking thinking. Remember, he had kind of started getting to a good place. It was becoming less about, I tried everything and nothing's working to, I'm getting with God and I'm understanding more about God and, and how He works and there is hope. But then our passage, verse number 1, he says, so I returned. Now I don't think this means physically that he returned back to where he was because nowhere in chapter 3 does he say where he was. He didn't say, oh, I went to, my, I went to the temple and began to think. He doesn't say anything. It just says, so I returned. I believe this to mean, in my thinking, I kind of started returning to where I was previously to when I started getting some victories. Well, how do you know he was thinking? Because that's the next two words. He says, so I returned and considered. Considered simply means to think, ponder within oneself. I'm considering painting the house bright yellow. I'm not really, but what I'm saying is I'm thinking about it. I'm pondering it. So here Solomon is. He was in a good spot. Then he starts stinking thinking. He's, he, he returns and he starts thinking and even what I would call overthinking about things. You say, well, what things was he thinking about? Well, that's what the rest of the text is. He says, so I returned and considered all the oppressions that are under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. And they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors, there was no power, but they had no comforter. He saw the oppression of the oppressed. I don't know if that's the right way to say that, but that's how it comes across. He saw, he saw men with power oppress people without power. He saw the tears of people who did not have the power to come up out from under their oppressors. He was witness to this. Now, we don't know if it was because from the palace he had a good vantage point of seeing this. We don't know if it was because people would bring their issues to the king and say, Hey, king, can you make this right? He did this, he did that. Maybe... Maybe he had done a pretty good job of getting rid of it in Jerusalem. But he goes on to say in verse number 2, understanding that he really couldn't stop it from the world. Because he says this, Wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. So as he sees the oppression, so everybody picture in your mind Solomon, maybe on his porch, on some balcony, overlooking the city of Jerusalem. And he sees... He sees a boss that is oppressing a slave. He sees a husband that is oppressing his wife. Maybe he, that day he had to deal with the issues of, of um, a thief or a, a merchant who was taking advantage of somebody that's hungry by overselling things because it's the only person they could get it from. He sees this oppression. He says, man, even, in, even if I could stop it in Jerusalem, I can't stop it in the whole world. And what that leads me to is wishing I was dead. Quite the downhill from where we were, where he started getting some hope. Now he's not. I imagine Solomon, and I know their cemeteries didn't look like our cemeteries, but remember, I always imagine, I picture the Bible, I try to bring it to life in my mind, and I can't help but think about cemeteries as I see cemeteries. So I imagine Solomon like seeing a cemetery and seeing somebody like exercising, like running by, and he says, I'd rather be in the hole than be the runner. Now some of you are like, I'm with him. I hate running. I'd rather be dead. <laughs> but he says, I, I would rather be dead than be alive. He says, you know what? Even worse than that. Worse than that. He says, it would have been better had I never been born. That's what verse 3 is essentially saying. He's saying, yea, better is he than both. So both what? Both the dead and the living. Which hath not yet been. As in never existed. Who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. He said, it would have been better than I was never born. That's quite the depression state right there. Remember, started out depressed. Believe it, I believe it with all my heart. When you're saying vanity, life is vanity, you're depressed. 
He goes from, life is vanity and I'm depressed, to, well, if God's in control, then I don't have to worry as much. If, I have to, if I'm in control, I do have to worry, but if God's in control, I can relax. And in time, God will make everything beautiful. That's what he says. God will make everything beautiful in his time. And without God, we're like animals, but with God, we have the propensity to be something better. But then I returned. Then I started thinking about oppression. I started thinking about people. I started thinking about the situation in this world. And it got me thinking, life kind of sucks. I'd rather just be dead. Better yet, I wish I was never born. That's the passage. So now we get to start preaching. Aren't you excited? If the most wealthy and powerful man in the world can backslide and get to where he thinks it would be better to have never been born... Is it possible that we, through the difficult situations in life, might at some point think the same thing? No, if the, if the richest, most powerful, you could, you could make the argument, I would argue against it, but some would make the argument, the best king Israel ever had, at least considering the amount of territory they were, they were able, to, able to get taxes from and things of that nature and the financial state of it. And those, that man, if he could say... I'm depressed. I don't, want, I don't want to live. I wish I was never born. Do you think that maybe we might go through some difficult situations that might make us think, it'd be better had I never been around, had I never been through this? So what are some ways we can start the stinking thinking? Because that's what, ultimately it was stinking thinking that led Solomon to this point. He was doing good and then he started returning and then he started considering and he started overthinking and he got to the stinking thinking and then he wants to kill himself. Or not kill himself, but he wishes he was dead. So what are some ways we do that? Here's some ways we do that. We start thinking wrong about our world. This is the exact thing that got Solomon off. He was thinking about the oppression and the oppressed of the, the powerless people being oppressed in the society. We can do the same. How can our society allow such wickedness like abortion? Or, or how, could our, how, could our society, uh, how could our society be promoting this kind of agenda that is obviously so anti-God? How, could our, how can our country survive if we continue down this path and this schism? And we get thinking, listen, we start thinking about our world. By the way, it can go beyond the United States. Where you start thinking of, of communist China and the issues there. And you start thinking of Nepal and the issues there. And you start thinking of Japan and the issues there. You start thinking of Mexico and the issues there. And, and Brazil and the issues there. And Nicaragua and the issues there. And in, and in Israel and the issues there. And you get, start thinking about those and go, man, this world is in trouble. Man, it's not worth living in this world. And, I can, and it can really start to make you think, it's just not worth trying. It's not worth continuing. We can think wrong about ourselves. A lot of us struggle with this. Some, like me, on the opposite end, I'm probably a little too high on myself. <laughs> I may not be God's gift to the earth, but I'm at least God's gift to one woman. And as the Bible proclaims, you're your gift as the pastor. <laughs> That's all true. But... <laughs> It's all biblically true, but how I, how I just portrayed it's terrible. <laughs> Anyways. By the way, that is still wrong thinking. That's why God will let me just fall all over myself in a song or in a message or not know what to do in a situation, so I'm reminded I still need Him. But some, it's the opposite. Some are really quite low on themselves. Maybe you commit some sin or you're struggling continually with a sin and you think, how could I be saved? Or how can I try to serve God with this in my life? There's somebody I have in my mind right now who's not saved. And I think the thing that's keeping them from getting saved is something that they're committing continually in their life. We can think too much about what we can't do. You get over, overly focused on the things you can't do. Man, yeah, it's great to have these new piano tracks. But man, I wish somebody could just play the piano. But I know I could never do it. If pastor's going to butcher specials like that, man, it'd be great if somebody else could sing specials, but I can't. Man, I wish, there was, uh, I wish there was some other place that I could serve. I wish I could get that done. I wish I could fix that. I wish I could pay for that. I wish I could do that. We can overthink our failures. The times we did try to do something and it didn't work out quite like we wanted. Try to be a blessing to somebody and you kind of fell on your face or it didn't work out or you try to encourage somebody and you end up, it ends up not being near as encouraging. We can overthink our looks. 
We can, we can uh, in a society that is driven by the physical, we can think it to ourselves, I'm not as pretty, or I'm not as good looking, or I'm not as, I'll never have this because I don't look like that. And that can get you to thinking, man, this life's really not worth living. We can think wrong about others. Someone in the church does something or says something and you immediately think it had to be on purpose. Had to be. By the way, I always tell people, give them the benefit of the doubt. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And if you're not sure why they did what they did, give them the benefit of the doubt. I was reminded of that all summer with our intern. I'm like, I don't know why he did it. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt until I talk to him. <laughs> I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he just didn't understand. But we can think, to, man, they had to do that on purpose. <laughs> You can think, hang on, let, let's get closer to home. You can think wrong about your spouse. They don't really love me. If they loved me, they wouldn't do this. If they really cared about me, they wouldn't do that. If they really respected me, they wouldn't do this. If they, if they cared about me, X, Y, or Z would never happen. You can think wrong about your pastor. I'm not going to give examples. <laughs> They'd all sound self-serving, so I'm not doing it. You can think wrong about your kids. Either the way they treat you makes you sad, or maybe the wrong thinking that you think that everything they do is awesome. I think the biggest problem with coaching is trying to parent parents and let them know that your kid is not the all-star on this team. We're glad your kid got his pants on the right way today. And if everybody a chance to bat, if it wasn't required that everybody got a chance to bat, your kid wouldn't. <laughs> but they think, in their mind, my kid's the greatest. My kid's infallible. My kid's perfect. We can think wrong about our parents. Well, I wouldn't be this way. My life wouldn't be so difficult if my parents had just, or if my parents hadn't, if only they had. You can think wrong about God. Fear. Hopelessness, those things are not a product of confusion. None of those things are a product of God. And yet so many people struggle with confusion. Uh, I, I want to say this very lovingly. The people that struggle with their sexual identity, as they would call it, they're confused not because they serve a God that is confused. They're confused because they think wrong about God. Fear. Afraid to do whatever it is. Fear to be bold, is if we tie in this morning's message. That is wrong thinking about God. If He's with me, who do I have to be afraid of? But yet none of us approach the world that way, or most of us don't. Why? Because we aren't thinking right about God. Hopelessness. I just don't know if that's ever going to work out. I don't know how this is ever going to make it. I don't know how it's going to... And, and worrying about the future and worrying about situations and worrying about things that are beyond our control. Why? Because we've thought wrong about our God. We've forgotten that He's, he's God. And He's gracious and merciful and kind and loving. And all of a sudden, listen to me, you didn't have to verbalize a single one of those things. You, never, you may not have said it to your spouse. You may not have said it to me. You may not have said it to another church member. You may not have said it to a family member, a friend, or a co-worker. Because it's in your mind, all of a sudden now you're struggling. Now you're wondering if being faithful to church is worth it. Now you're wondering if giving to God is worth it. Now you're wondering if serving God is, if there's even a point. Because you're the only one that does it anyway. Or you're the only one that does this. Or you're the one that feels this. And all of a sudden, listen, no, this, is, this is what happens. I think, therefore I am. It's in their mind. It's in their heart. And eventually, that's the action. So if it can happen to Solomon, it can happen to any of us. It could be happening right now. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, hopefully I'll show you a couple things you can do right here from the text. What to do to stop the stinking thinking. i got to quit saying that. It sounds dumb. But it's what my pastor used to say. Sometimes, you know, your pastor's words sometimes can just reign in your mind forever illustrations, things he said, like, if nothing's changed, nothing's changed. I can hear Brother McKinley's voice in my head saying that right now. Stinking thinking. But here we go. Here's what we can do. Number one, number one, when you start struggling with the stinking thinking, 
Remember God. Remember God. Solomon had forgotten that he had a comforter. Look, look back at verse number 1. This is so good. He says, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of such that were oppressed. Listen, talking about those that are oppressed, he said, And they had no comforter. And then he goes on to say, And on the side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comforter. Solomon, you know the comforter. While the world may feel hopeless at this time, you know the solution to the problem. Why aren't you focused on that? Because he forgot God. Do you realize he was the son of a man who knew the comforter like none of us? We, we're going through Psalms on Sunday night, or on Wednesday night, I mean, and it's so many of them are David where he knows who God is. He knows who the comforter is. He knows who to go to in situations. He knows who to go to in unfairness. He knows who to go to in problems. He knows who to go to in scary situations. He knows to go, who to go to when his financials are bad, when his, his physical is bad, when, when, when his life is at stake. David, Solomon's father, knew who the comforter was. And yet Solomon, who would have had access to every one of the Psalms that we read, and then some, he would have heard them sung in the temple. He would have heard them in the temple gates. He would have heard them sung by a choir. He had forgotten about God and he was only focused on those that were going through hardships. I, I look around and I'll be honest, there's so many times I see bad things. I go to the store and I see parents who have no business having kids. I mean that in the nicest way, but I just, you're just like, those poor kids. Those people didn't want to be parents. Those people still don't want to be parents. And you get so upset because you're like, those kids are oppressed. They'll never be what God wants them to be. And then I say, hang on, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm limiting my God. Because <laughs> my God's bigger than, than situations. And my God is the great comforter. And my God is bigger than those. And maybe I see somebody that's going through hardship. And by the way, I, I, can, I can be sad and sorrowful and cry with you through physical like, through hardships. Because the reality is we go through them. But you know why I won't get down about it? Because I... I know God can help you, even when I can't. Man, if I had a million dollars or a billion dollars and I, had, and I owned ten houses and a hundred cars, and I could just fix everybody's problems in my mind. But I can't. So you should be upset about it? No, because I know the God that can. I know the God that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Here's what, uh, here's what I wrote down. If you want to change the way you think, you need to remember that we serve a very wonderful God who is merciful and gracious and our ever-present help. Are you struggling with fear? Fear of tomorrow? Fear of your health? Fear of your finances? Are you struggling with hopelessness? Are you struggling with worrying? Are you struggling with bitterness? Are you struggling with, with uh, um, selfishness? Are you struggling with any kind of problem? Your answer is God. Here's what uh, Psalms 46 verse 1 says. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Keep your mind on Him. Well, how do I do that? Well, how about reading His Word and praying? That's a simple way to get your mind on the fact that God's bigger. I'm reading through Romans right now. Romans chapter 9 this morning. I started that. And then the Psalms for Old Testament. It's really hard to, to forget how good our God is when I'm reading about a man who's uh, named... Paul, who used to be named Saul, who's now writing to the church in, in Rome, and he's proclaiming to them one of the greatest books in the Bible, and they're all great, but I mean Romans is just dense and rich with doctrine. It's really hard to forget how good my God is, the fact that I'm re I get to read that. Or even a psalm. How about praying? How about the music you listen to? We often forget that. Music affects our hearts and our, our spirit and our soul so powerfully. It's, so much, it's, known, it's not even a secret. It's known. That's why grocery stores, shopping malls, anywhere you go, there's certain types of music they play because they're trying to elicit a certain type of activity. Because music affects you. How about in your activities? So that's number one. Remember God. Number two. Don't be inwardly focused. Solomon thought it would be better to be dead or never born instead of what God had him on this planet for. No, here he is. He's king of 
of Israel. At this time, arguably the most powerful nation in the world. Rich, powerful. They, they, they may not have possessed all the promised land, which by the way, if you didn't know that, Israel never physically possessed all the promised land. It won't happen until the millennial reign. That's facts, just so you know. But under Solomon's reign, they may not have possessed all the land, but they possessed as much as they ever had, and the ones that they didn't had to pay tribute to Solomon. Powerful man. And all of a sudden, all that. Can we just establish that's a lot of responsibility? Uh, you're king of God's nation, you're king of God's people. You are the most important man in the world. God needs, doesn't need you, but God is looking to use you. And you know what he was thinking about? Me. <sighs> I can't stop all the oppression in the world. I might as well just kill myself. I'd rather be dead than alive. I'd rather, I wish my mom would have never gave birth to me. You know what he was thinking of? Him. Instead of what God had him on this planet for. Your thought process will get off the tracks if you turn inward. When it comes about you and what you have going on in your life... It's a problem. I've shared the story uh, of me rolling a vehicle and getting arrested and having to have community service. But I'll tell you, community service was one of the best things that ever happened to me. At a very pivotal age of 16 years old, I walked into a soup kitchen only concerned about my issues. Got it. Are my parents ever going to let me drive again? <laughs> Even if the state says I can, are they going to let me? <laughs> and uh, what... Oh, I really didn't know what my parents were going to do about their blazer. I, I, I was pretty confident they were going to make me pay for every dime of it. They just made me pay the deductible and insurance covered it. But I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about, man, I messed up. And, and I was inwardly focused. And then I walked in there. And for hours, I helped prepare meals for hungry people at a soup kitchen. And then I watched people come through the line that, were, that didn't probably sleep in a bed as nice as the one I slept in, that didn't have another vehicle that they can drive that they just happened to wreck their parents, one of their parents' vehicles that their parents were able to replace. And I watched people that were going through all these real issues, and I was like, oh, wow, my issues aren't that big. God's put me on this planet. At this time, I'm saved. I know I'm called to preach. I know I'm supposed to be a witness and testimony. It's like, God's got a bigger, folk, or a bigger thing going on in my life than me being comfortable and happy. It's about me propagating the gospel. And it got me off of thinking of myself, which for a 16-year-old is pretty hard, especially when I'm the 16-year-old. So you want to stop the stinking thinking? Stop being inwardly focused. How do I do that? It's amazing. Serve people. Serve people. When you're doing for someone else, it's pretty hard to think for yourself. Oftentimes, it amazes me. My wife sometimes won't even think about what she's going to eat. She's fed three kids lunch, and I'm like, what did you have? She's like, I haven't ate yet. Why? She's busy serving others. Thoughts of herself haven't even come to her mind yet. That's a mom thing, because I'm like, I'll get you fed as soon as I'm done eating my... <laughs> <laughs> serve others. Hey, serve at church. Serve at church. Ask God to help you serve others. You are here, literally on this earth, to serve. That's not like, a, a, like an encouragement. That's the literal sense of why you're here. To serve. How? Physically and spiritually by telling people about Jesus Christ. Number three, the last one here. You want to stop the stinking thinking. Praise the right thing. Praise the right thing. Solomon literally in our passage praised death. Look, look back at verse number two. Wherefore I praised the dead, which are already dead. He's praising the people that already got to leave this planet. That's what he was praising. So is that a problem? Uh, yeah, kind of, because Psalms 148.13 says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Solomon should have really just been focused on praising God. What are you praising today? You're struggling with thinking, well, I'd ask you, what are you praising? Here's what praising means. The word praise from verse 2 means this, to glory in, commend, or triumph in. So what are you glorying in? What are you triumphant in? What do you commend to others? Is it your job? I can say from Solomon's experience, 
if, if it's all about your job, that's not going to last very long. You'll find out it's vanity. Is it your activities? Where you went camping, where you went hunting, what your kids are doing, your family, your ways of doing things. Everybody thinks their way of doing things is the best. Everybody does. Drives me nuts. Well, when I do laundry, I... Well, when I wash my car, I'm like, dude, you don't wash your car, I can see it. <laughs> well, you know, when I iron shirts, I'm like, dude, you ain't ever ironed a shirt in your life. Don't, don't lie. <laughs> but everybody, everybody thinks the way we do things is the greatest. Maybe you glory or praise yourself. I did that a little bit in the message, so I'll have to go to the altar too. You'll find it's hard to backslide, or get depressed, or think wrong when you're always praising God. Psalms 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's what David said. How do we do that, Pastor? One small thing that helps me, and this really is just a very small thing, I'm not trying to make this out to be some big thing, but I, I use a Bible reading journal, and in that journal, I've, I've shared this, the end of the journal is, what are you thankful for that day? No matter what I put on that line, do you realize it's all praise to God? If I put my family, well, who gave me that family? If I put my wife, who gave me that wife? Well, I mean, <laughs> it wasn't that hard. It was like he was working with, some of y'all, I'm just kidding. No, it's God. When I put my kids, well, who gave me those kids? When I put my church, and by my church, I mean the church that I get, a, get to be a part of, not ownership, but part of. When I put my church, well, who put me here? When I put that I get to preach, that's what I put this morning. Every Sunday morning, I think I put that down, that I get to preach. Well, who allowed me, to, who called me and allowed me and enabled me? No matter what I put in that line, it's a praise to God. And then, that's at the beginning of every day. At the end of the day, when we do family devotions, I go around. Okay, Izzy, what are you thankful for? Okay, Bubby, what are you thankful for? We asked Brody. He hasn't said nothing yet, but I'm waiting for him to go, Dad, Dad, and I'll be like, that's right. <laughs> and then Holly says what she's thankful for. Somehow, usually always stealing mine, but because I go last, I've got to think of something else. And in, hang on. In those simple moments... Simple moments. I'm not talking about anything profound or like... Because truthfully, the Christian life isn't anything difficult or profound. It's the little, doing the right things at the right times, the little things through life. But it's that, filling out my journal after I read my Bible and pray. It's, it's sitting around with my family, singing Psalms 119, verse 11, that word I have, singing that, and then getting them to say what they're thankful for. And it's amazing even to hear what kids are, are thankful for because sometimes it reminds you of things that you don't even think about that are also blessings. Yeah. And then to express something. Something as small as that. It's really hard to, it's really hard to get stinking thinking when you're, when you're going, man, God's so good. Yeah. When, I can, when, I, when, when, when I can journal every day and, and not duplicate what I'm thankful for that day, it's really hard to get to thinking, man, this world, this world just ain't worth living in. Solomon did. Because he got his mind off the right thing. He started overthinking the wrong things. Solomon started to make good progress, progress in chapter 3, and then a little stinking thinking, as my pastor would call it, got him backsliding. This book, let's, get to the, let's go macro here. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes, I titled it, The Pursuit of Happiness and Purpose. Because that's what Solomon was going after. He wanted happiness and purpose. You will never have either unless your thinking is right. You think, therefore you are. So, I'll end it like this. Don't overthink it. You have God. So that's pretty simple. I know. You can dissect, I can dissect that. I just kind of did, but I can dissect that for an hour. You don't, you don't have to overthink the, the financial situations you're going through. You have God. You don't have to overthink the health complications you're going through. You have God. You don't have to overthink the, the family issues that you have, that you're dealing with. You have God. You don't have to worry about what's coming tomorrow. You have God. You don't have to fear what's going to happen to you next year. 
You have God. You don't have to stress about your kids and how they're going to turn out. Now, I'm not saying that just absolves you of being a good parent. You've got to do what's right. They obviously have to make their choice. But you have God. Do you see that in every situation in life? Just don't overthink it. You have God. Solve, solve the problems. You'll, never, you'll no longer struggle with bitterness, worthlessness, hopelessness, fear, anger. Now, there's righteous anger sometimes where you want to... For God, but... But the bad kind I'm talking about. You won't have to worry about any of those things. Because you're not going to overthink it. Because you got God. I'm going to take this to a salvation level just real quick. I don't ever stress about where I'm going to go when I die. Praise the Lord. Never. Haven't, I haven't struggled with doubt probably since before college. High school would have been the last time. So what changed? Um, I just started to go, if God said He did it, then He did it. And anytime I'm struggling with doubt, what I'm saying is, God, you're not big enough to do something really simple that you said you'd do. And then I stop doubting it. You know, I don't doubt where I'm going to go. I don't worry about what's going to happen to me when I die. I don't worry about, uh, about my eternity because I have God. Let me encourage you, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior today, you can know Him as your personal Savior. It's simply that trusting in Him as your personal Savior is simply knowing God. Say, so, well, I do know God. Well, I mean knowing Him on a personal level. You died on the cross for your sins. You, gotta, you, you need to understand that. You've got to know that you're a sinner and that if you died today that you'd split hell wide open. And then you just got to simply ask Him to save you, repenting of your sins, and He'll do it. That simple. Don't overthink it. You have God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time in Your Word. Thank You for the encouragement that this can be. Lord, I think our thinking must need to be adjusted because these messages have all kind of surrounded that theme of thinking, thinking wrong. Uh, from Wednesday to even this morning of thinking that being a secret disciple is enough to this afternoon of just the stinking thinking, Lord, and uh, help us to get our thinking right, and it'll change the way we live our lives. It'll change what we do for you. It's all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless.